Hey, brother! Boy, oh boy, you guys. Today is a rather strange topic for us here at Super Carlin Brothers because we have spent an enormous amount of time contemplating what would have happened if Harry had been placed in Slytherin. I won't lie, it's probably one of the most fun scripts we've ever written here at SCB. But I'm currently on my like umpteenth reread of the Harry Potter saga, and I'm currently in the Great Hall once again, where Harry is watching on with his fellow classmates as the Sorting Hat ceremony begins. And finally, it is his turn to lower the hat upon his head. Hmm, said a small voice in his ear. Difficult, very difficult. Plenty of courage, I see. Not a bad mind either. There's talent, oh my goodness, yes. And a nice thirst to prove yourself. Now, that's interesting. That Sorting Hat voice will completely destroy my voice in no time flat. What's interesting to me though, Mr. Sorting Hat, is it kind of seems like based on what you're saying is that Harry kind of embodies characteristics of each of the other houses. The first comment, of course, plenty of courage is a very clear nod to Gryffindor. Then the next line, not a bad mind either, seems like a small nod to Ravenclaw. Although it does feel like the hat is maybe hedging just like a little bit there, like, how's his mind? It's a not bad. Try being a dinner guest at your friend's house and letting the house know that the food is not bad. The next line that we have is there's talent, which seems like it could refer to really any of the four houses, but possibly you'd mark it under Hufflepuff simply because the next line, a nice thirst to prove yourself, absolutely kind of has that like ring of ambition, which would coincide with Slytherin. But this is also the moment where Harry interjects and starts whispering, not Slytherin, not Slytherin. And as we all know, this is when the hat seems to like actually counter Harry's own insight a little bit, suggesting that maybe the hat believes it knows better than Harry. Not Slytherin, eh? Are you sure? You could be great. You know, it's all here in your head and Slytherin will help you on the way to greatness. No doubt about that. I have always read this as, and I feel like the entire book, Chamber of Secrets, revolves around the idea that if Harry had not interjected in this moment, the hat would have placed him in Slytherin. But after just like years and years of examination of this story, I've always sort of felt like the hat did have somewhat of a point, but I'm not totally sure that I still agree with that sentiment. So today we are going to explore whether or not Harry should have been placed in House Slytherin. Guys, before we dive on in, I wanna invite you to a brand new Super Carlin Brothers project is a podcast called Through the Gryffindor, where Jay and I are going chapter by chapter through the entire saga, breaking down all of our favorite like little details, Easter eggs, foreshadowing plot holes. Uh, it is available wherever pods are cast. There's also a link to a YouTube channel in the description down below. Please check it out. Now, you might be aware of the common observation that the golden trio, Harry, Ron, and Hermione, while all three are Gryffindors, are all each supposed to represent one of the other three houses. Hermione is incredibly clever and values intelligence and would have done extremely well under the banner of Ravenclaw. Heck, even a member of House Ravenclaw can't understand why Hermione is not in their house. You can do a protein charm, said Terry Poot. Yes, said Hermione, but that's NEWT standard that is, he said weakly. Oh, said Hermione, trying to look modest. Oh, well, yes, I suppose it is. How come you're not in Ravenclaw? He demanded, staring at Hermione with something close to wonder. It's the modesty for me. Ravenclaw's over there thinking they're so cool because they totally are. Man! Ron doesn't necessarily get the same level of glowing endorsement from a member of House Hufflepuff, but it does seem like his key characteristics revolve around friendship and loyalty. Although based on the frequency at which he basically requires Hermione's help to finish any essay, I'm not exactly sure he's nailing down the hardworking aspect. Although I guess you can make the argument that he works awfully hard to get Hermione to do it for him. So maybe it's all a matter of perspective or maybe it's not. Although the point is this observation would then round off rather nicely with Harry, who of course does end up going down as one of the most famous wizards of all time, which arguably any Slytherin and their associated ambition would have aspired to. And if not for a bit of early persuading from Hagrid, who says, there's not a single witch or wizard who went bad who wasn't in Slytherin, you know who was one. And then we've got Ron on the train who says, Gryffindor, said Ron, gloom seemed to be settling in on him again. Mom and dad ran it too. I don't know what they'll say if I'm not. I don't suppose Ravenclaw would be too bad, but imagine if they put me in Slytherin. And then we've also got the exchange between Harry and Draco at Madame Malkin's, which sort of represents what Slytherin might look like to Harry in the form of Malfoy, who is the worst. But prior to these select exchanges, Harry knows 
nothing about any of the houses at school. He doesn't even know that there is a sorting ceremony at all. So if he doesn't go into the ceremony with any knowledge about what Slytherin is even like, he doesn't know to ask not to be placed there. So the big question for today is determining whether or not the Sorting Hat's assertion that Harry would be a good fit for Slytherin is wrong. Something that we know from Pottermore, the Sorting Hat is not quick to admit. The Sorting Hat is notorious for refusing to admit that it has made a mistake in its sorting of a student. On those occasions when Slytherins have behaved altruistically or selflessly, when Ravenclaws flunk all of their exams, when Hufflepuffs prove lazy yet academically gifted, and when Gryffindors exhibit cowardice. The hat steadfastly backs its original decision. And to be fair, we know throughout the larger story that there are absolutely instances where the sorting hat can see what you value the most, and that's what's guiding its decision to place you in your respective house. Take, for example, Neville. Again, from Pottermore, we get the following. In Neville's case, the hat was determined to place him in Gryffindor. Neville, intimidated by that house's reputation for bravery, requested a placing in Hufflepuff. What we see in this particular case is that the sorting hat was able to see clearly clearly through Neville's own concerns and worries that he might not be a good fit for Gryffindor and ultimately is able to see what Neville values the most, which is bravery. And when the time comes, we know that Neville absolutely just grows into his potential as a true Gryffindor. Interestingly though, about this case in particular is that the Sorting Hat is actually overriding Neville's request to be placed into Hufflepuff. And that's particularly notable as we address our next point. Guys, I want to take a quick pause right there to tell you about these amazing 3D Harry Potter puzzles from today's sponsor, 4D Build. If you're looking for an incredibly fun and challenging task for your next rainy day, then you've got to check out these puzzles. They come in a box just like this, but when you're done, you get these really cool finished products that looks just absolutely amazing on your shelf. Not gonna lie, I am super obsessed with the Hedwig version of it. I mean, just look at like the size and detail of this guy. And everything you need to complete the set comes inside of the box down to the cardboard sheets themselves, the instructions, and a punch tool. And honestly, I really wasn't sure what to expect with like a three-dimensional model that's made out of cardboard, but the instructions are incredibly clear and very easy to follow. Each piece has a number and color dot to make sure that you're making all of the correct connections. The smaller versions, like the little hairy guy here, takes about two to three hours to construct, while the bigger ones, like Hedwig, can take six to seven. And again, these are the perfect rainy day activity or just quiet, lazy Sunday, like crack on one of the audio books, tune in, listen along as you build. The other thing that I was really blown away by because they're made of cardboard is I was like, I don't know what the finished product will be like, but they're like incredibly sturdy. And again, they look so good across the room on the shelf. They've really just been so meticulous in the design and instructions associated with like putting these things together to ensure you're having a really great time as you're going through the build and that the finished product ends up being spectacular. So whether you're a Harry Potter super fan yourself, which if you're watching this channel, I, I, I might assume that you partially are, or if you just have a friend or family member or loved one who is, these are absolutely a great gift. Because in addition to looking great, they're also very affordable with the smaller models coming in at just 15 to $20 and the larger models like the Hogwarts castle coming in around 60. And if you'd like to branch out from the Harry Potter fandom at all, you can easily do so. They also have kits for Star Wars and Marvel. These puzzles are available at Target and Amazon. I will leave links to both of those in the description down below. Again, I highly recommend you go and check them out. Pick up a puzzle or two because again, they're super affordable and just a lot of fun. Link in the description down below. Now, back to the video. We see at the end of Chamber of Secrets that Harry has just been really struggling with the Sorting Hat's insistence that House Slytherin could have been the proper house for him. Especially as Harry is facing accusations of being the very heir of Slytherin that opened the Chamber of Secrets. Everyone tries to assure Harry that this can't possibly be the case because he was, of course, placed in House Gryffindor. But what Harry knows inside of his own mind is that the hat really considered putting him in Slytherin. This request, though, in Dumbledore's eyes is absolutely vital to one of the most major themes of the entire series. It is our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are far more than our abilities. And Dumbledore speaking a little bit from personal experience here and his own resistance to meddling with the dark arts. But you're different. Everyone knows you're the only one you know who, all right, Voldemort was frightened of. You flatter me, said Dumbledore calmly. Voldemort had powers I will never have, only because you're too, well, noble to use them. Both of these passages lead me to my next point, which I think is a very important detail to consider and is of course the piece of Voldemort's soul that is actively residing inside 
of Harry. It's the piece of Voldemort's soul that lodged itself inside of Harry when it had nowhere else to go after his spell backfired when he attempted to kill baby Harry as a child. And it's the same piece of soul that allows Harry to have the ability of parcel tongue. And the big question that I personally wonder in relation to this point is whether or not Harry was actually course correcting what was otherwise a potentially misled sorting hat. Now remember, the hat claims to have never been wrong, and at least to be fair, it does place him in House Gryffindor, which ultimately is a pretty seamless fit for Harry. But was it wrong of the sorting hat to assume that Harry would have done well in Slytherin? Or more specifically, would the sorting hat have seen this potential inside of Harry if not for the piece of Voldemort's soul that was living inside of him? Who again would be giving off awfully significant Slytherin vibes given the fact that Tom Riddle is quite literally the heir of Salazar Slytherin. And I personally do believe that it is playing a rather significant factor and possibly even what's narrowing down the decision to specifically Gryffindor or Slytherin. But to clarify, maybe not the entire influence. Let me explain. Harry might just actually carry some of Slytherin's traits all on his own. Again, if we go back to the characteristics listed by the hat when first placed on Harry's head, we get the following. Plenty of courage, I see, and not a bad mind either. There's talent, oh my goodness, yes, and a nice thirst to prove yourself. Again, that talent one isn't necessarily specifically clear to Hufflepuff, but there are four characteristics listed here and four potential houses. And I've always sort of read this as like, Harry, who is the chosen one, kind of embodies characteristics of all four. And now you might just simply argue that Ben, all of this, all of it is just a completely moot point because at the end of Chamber of Secrets, Harry is presented with a sorting hat where he successfully pulls out the sword of Gryffindor, something that only a true Gryffindor could accomplish. Only a true Gryffindor could have pulled that out of the hat, Harry. But if your argument here is that the proof of your allegiance to a specific house is your ability to interact with one of the founder's artifacts, then Harry is still, once again, potentially back in contention for Slytherin as he is the only one who is able to successfully interact with Slytherin's locket. By which I mean, he is the only one capable of opening it. On top of that, Tom Riddle tells Harry in the Chamber of Secrets, Parcel Tongue won't save you now, Potter. It only obeys me. Harry's kind of just taking Tom Riddle at face value here, but I actually think that if Harry had tried, the Basilisk absolutely would have listened to him. Because what I think Riddle actually means in this particular situation is that the Basilisk will only respond to the heir of Slytherin. But this Tom Riddle is woefully uninformed on what actually grants Harry's ability to speak Parseltongue in the first place, which is the piece of Voldemort's soul that exists within himself. So really, when you actually boil it all down, it's just Tom Riddle diary Horcrux versus Harry Potter living human Horcrux duking it out. If anything, the big difference to me is that Harry is still a whole and living person and Tom Riddle is sort of like an apparition of existence who hasn't like fully formed yet. So if anything, Harry probably even has the edge. But while that may be true, we also may have just snarled ourselves inside of our own proof. Because the only reason that Harry can interact with either Slytherin's Locket or the Basilisk is again, because of Voldemort's soul. And once that piece of soul is ultimately destroyed, Harry's ability to speak to snakes goes with it. And so what I'm trying to say is, I don't think that that removes Harry's like thirst to prove himself, but what it does do for sure is remove any physical proof that Harry specifically belongs in House Slytherin. But beyond that, the more that I've examined the story after all of these years, the more I feel like the main driving characteristic of Harry himself just simply is bravery, which is one of the most notable characteristics of House Gryffindor. We made a video earlier this week here on the Super Carlin Brothers channel explaining why Harry's Boggart taking the form of a Dementor represents his fear of fear, which according to Lupin is very wise. The short explanation of this entire concept is that fear is essentially the uncomfortable sensation you feel towards something that forces you into inaction. Bravery on the flip side is not the absence of fear, but the willingness to act in the face of that fear. And what we see for Harry is that this is true over and over and over again without fail throughout the entire story. It's what leads him down the trap door in Philosopher's Stone or into the Chamber of Secrets or to even come out and face Voldemort head to head in the graveyard, even though he's massively outclassed as a duelist. Heck, sometimes Harry's fears are even just like much, much, much more down to earth and much more of like what you might expect out of a classic high school student, like the fear of asking somebody to the Yule Ball. I was just wondering if maybe 
maybe you wanted to go to the ball with me. And while Cho does ultimately decline that invitation, he did work up the courage to ask. I am not gonna lie to you guys, when I was a kid and my dad was reading me Goblet of Fire, I just thought that this was the funniest thing that just ever happened. But even more than that, I still think we can even take that one line from the Sorting Hat that seems to be Harry's nod to how he would fit into House Slytherin. It's the thirst to prove yourself. And interestingly, Harry absolutely unequivocally does prove himself. But it's not in a quest for glory, something that I think Dumbledore absolutely clarifies in one of my all time favorite lines from the whole series. It's a curious thing, Harry, but perhaps those who are best suited to power are those who have never sought it. Those who, like you, have leadership thrust upon them and take up the mantle because they must and find to their own surprise that they wear it well. This, I think, with Harry's prevailing bravery and his ability to pull the sword of Gryffindor from the sorting hat, all but make him nothing more than a true blue Gryffindor. Red? However, if you would like to see if things had just gone ever so slightly differently and Harry had been placed into House Slytherin, we have spent a massive amount of time putting together a huge saga that explains like detail by detail what Harry's life would have been like if he had been sorted into Slytherin. It honestly was one of our favorite things that we've ever written here at Super Carlin Brothers. And we often say that we weren't really even writing the story so much as just discovering what truly would have happened if this had been the case. All I can do is recommend some popcorn because the entire saga is over five hours long. We can check out the whole thing right over here. But otherwise, guys, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Otherwise, until next time, bye.